My start was at Roller Coaster Skating World over in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. I'm thinking in the back of my mind, if we're, we're going to have these type of events for the teenagers. Instead of paying a DJ, we need to have a DJ in house. So I'm like, all right, well, cool. You know, I was in, I was also a part of a Christian hip hop group, you know, and all that. So I'm like, you know, we, I got this. Um, start looking into equipment, start looking into this, and just trying to figure out the whole DJ thing. And then when people was tell, would tell me, man, you should DJ, you should DJ, when I did my brother's house party then I kind of considered it a little bit more. It's one of those things you just don't see coming. It's like, okay, I'm, you know, a side hustle, something, something different, something I, can, something I can put with the video stuff that I'm doing, and, and then it turns out to be this thing. Um, so yeah. I was fascinated how the DJ always kind of run the party and you know, doing all those games, the you know, start, stop, red light, go, uh, speed skate, all that. You know, and it was kind of like, hmm, music has always been kind of a thing for me. Um, but then after I saw that and how much fun it was and how he was, I would go up and ask him questions and, and he was like, kid, go away, I'm, I'm busy. And I finally had gotten a, um, an, I got to be able to, to help him out a little bit. And he, ta he showed me some things and some of the scary stuff, you know, like when a record doesn't play, let's throw it across the roller rink. Um, if equipment don't work, just slam it on the floor. You know, it, it, it scarred me for life, but you know, it was, it was like, what is going on? But um, then I, I took a little bit of a break. Um, I did some uh, house parties and stuff, you know, back in the 
when I was a kid and my mom and I would go to Cats Records and Record Bar and disco was really a big thing for me because it was like it was the music that we would hear in the, ro the roller rink. Um, so I grew up with that and then um, went into the military and you know we'd go out to nightclubs and stuff when we'd have breaks and whatever and, and I'd see the DJ up there just having having his thing you know and and it just it kind of clicked with me it's like well, you know what why not so I, I uh, purchased some equipment terrible quality started recording myself DJing and, and I taught myself how to beat mix then I finally got um, a gig working at a radio station in Kansas City and I got to be a mid-afternoon DJ my first club gig at the club cabaret in Kansas City and that was back in 97 and I was the retro DJ. I stayed there until about 2002 when the, the club closed. It had been open for like since the 70s and closed in 2002. And then I moved over to another club, uh, Missy B's, which is a, it's a, another gay establishment in Kansas City. And I became the lead DJ working there um, five nights a week. So I was there for about seven years and I moved to Atlanta. And when I moved to Atlanta, I got a job at Burkhart's um, working as the, the DJ there working again five to six nights a week and you know the the nightlife in Atlanta at least the gay nightlife in Atlanta uh, was transitioning into a completely different like just a whole slew of different DJs were producing music so I was there for um, yeah, about a couple of years and I also uh, DJed at the jungle and uh, which is no longer unfortunately and uh, a Latin club called Chaparral and was doing their Friday night Latin night and Sunday night Latin, you know, just regular night for their uh, DJing drag shows and different stuff. But um, after I moved away from Atlanta, I moved back to Chattanooga. So I moved back here to be with my family. And luckily enough, I got a, a gig at Images, which is another gay night club here. And I was there for a couple of years. I graduated from a performing arts school. I was a music theater grad, a music theater major. Uh, from, from sixth grade through 12th grade, you know, so uh, performing arts was all I knew, singing, dancing, acting, um, that was my life, you know, so, so to, to do that and then um, to graduate and not even really have a conversation like college or life after high school, you know, life after performing arts and music theater and all that, what do you do? So the first thing I did was, like most people did, would do, I went and I got a job, so, but we struggled financially. So, you know, I'm, I'm 20 something young man trying to figure it out. Um, 2011, you know, but during that time, my, my wife and I, we were very heavily involved with church. Uh, we took our arts school, uh, talents, you know, and just and put it into ministry. We were uh, dating. We've been together since high school. Let me put that out there. Been together since high school. So um, she's watching me grow up. So, you know, we took everything, the, the praise and worship, the music that she writes. We just took all that, the choreography. You know, I was teaching dance classes during that time as well. So we just took all that and just, and just you know, was doing it in church. So we were heavily involved with the youth. 2011, uh, we were building a, a youth facility, starting, you know, and all that kind of thing. We started having these ideas, you know, uh, hang out nights for the teens and all that. So I'm thinking in the back of my mind, if we're, we're going to have these type of events for the teenagers. Instead of paying a DJ, we need to have a DJ in house. So I'm like, all right, well, cool. You know, I was and I was also a part of a Christian hip hop group, you know, and all that. So I'm like, you know, we, I got this. Um, Start looking into equipment, start looking into this and just trying to figure out the whole DJ thing. I'm doing the video thing. My boss is the photographer, so he's doing the photo thing. But up on stage, the DJ is doing his thing. Now that DJ ended up being Philip Newton, who actually owns Soundforce Entertainment. And he was watching me and he, he noticed that, you know, maybe that, 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 that guy's got the good personality to be the kind of DJ that could work for him. He calls my boss, you know, the next week, um, asks, asks me about it. I jump on the phone, you know, hey, have you ever thought about being a DJ? I'm like, yeah, we'll give it a shot. So we set something up for two weeks later. Um, he's going to train me on how to do events and weddings and, and the like. So I'm hanging out at a bar called Fox and Hound. The word was the karaoke DJ wasn't coming. So I have Philip's number and I'm like, hey, dude, I know you wanted to train me in a couple of weeks, but this guy didn't show up. Maybe you can bring some gear and you can start teaching me now and we'll figure it out. And he says, well, that's our gig anyway the company's gig, the DJ that he assigned to it, called out, got sick, whatever. He said, I'll just bring you some gear and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the ropes tonight. I'm like, sweet. That gig turned into the next three years of Wednesday night karaoke. And, and then it turns out to be this thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, 
And that was the initial beginning. That's how, that's how it actually all started. But what made me go ahead and DJ is a guy did my mama's 50th birthday party. And I always had music all the time. I always got music early and I always did stuff like that with music. So I, um, I told that dude, and that's probably disrespectful now that I'm a DJ. I went up to do is like, hey man, you ain't playing nothing we want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, I got some CDs in the car of some stuff that my mama liked. I was like, they already mixed up. I can just give them to you. Yeah, yeah and you just, just play it, just play this. When I was doing Brain Alumni Cookout, he came up. I ain't seen this dude in about 10 years, but I remembered him though. And he came up and was like asking me for music. He was like, you know, I, I do this too sometimes. And I was thinking, you that sorry motherfucker that did my, <laughs> that did my mama's party, dude. Yeah. I was like, you don't even know. You my inspiration. You the reason why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Dude, him. Yeah. I always knew I wanted to do something with music. Uh, I really wanted to produce music and make my own music, but I didn't know how I could get into that. You know what I mean? I didn't know how to, I could get into doing that and the steps that it took to do that, even though I had a couple of friends that did it, but I didn't really know the steps to do that. But I always had music. I always had a lot of music. Every time like we went to a party or did something like that, like a house party or something like that, I would play the music. Yeah, first club gig was 1997, because I was, I was I was still in the military. A friend of mine in a platoon was getting married and he needed a DJ and I said, well, I'll go ahead and do it for you. It was horrible. And they had a specific, very specific uh, playlist that they wanted and I had to go out and buy pretty much every bit of music because at that time there was no downloads because we didn't have internet. And then people started coming up and requesting songs and didn't have it. I just did not have it. And you know, they were getting all upset and the family was like, Oh, well, this is not the music that we want to hear, and, and I say, well, this is what the, 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 the married couple wants. This is what they want to hear. Well, we're paying the bill, and it just got worse and worse and worse, and so it, it went bad. It went really bad, because, you know, then the, the, the bride's uh, mother and father, they got, they're the ones that actually got mad, you know, and when the mother, the mother and father of the bride get mad, then, of course, the bride gets upset, because she's trying to make them happy, and then, of course, then she sees what their point is, and then it just no I remember my first gig uh yeah my first gig was a wedding um it was a friend of mine i used to do house parties at my brother's house so he asked me he was like man i want you to do my wedding do my wedding and i was like uh, i don't think i can do a wedding and he was like yeah you can do it you can do it go ahead and do my wedding and i was like all right i'll try it so I had a house house speaker receiver. I had uh, two little Bose speakers. <laughs> I had a Polk audio subwoofer, a 10 inch subwoofer. Yeah, all hooked up to a receiver and I had a double DIN uh, CD player that just, with a crossfade on it, it went from song to song. That's what I had and that's what I had to do his way with, yeah. I did his wedding with that. And what's crazy is I got like probably about five or six referrals from that wedding. Really? Yeah, I don't even get five or six referrals now. <laughs> <laughs> and once I started getting gigs from that, my gigs just started going. And I used to go to Renaissance and get speakers because I didn't have my speakers yet. I get these big right. tall speakers that still didn't hardly sound like nothing. And I still had my receiver that I grew up with. <laughs> My double then this player. Yeah. My introduction into professionalism was June uh, 2012, and it was for a friend of mine who I went to high school with. At the time, I didn't I only had one set up. I had two uh, Mackies and on some tripods and a little rinky dink looking table with a $150 Newmark controller in a case that cost $300 and a mixer that cost $40. And, some, some type of plastic microphone. I have no idea what brand that was now. Um, and I'm at the Choo Choo, in, in the Imperial Ballroom at the Choo Choo. And so they had the ceremony outside, you know, and then I, I didn't have the, I couldn't provide microphones for the officiant. I didn't have any capital. I couldn't invest in anything. So uh, I did the best I could. You know, they, they took the little mic and used it, passed it. They didn't have a problem with it. Really? And I'm laughing at it because 
Uh, now I'm looking like, what the heck are you doing? They got by with it. We transitioned to the inside for the reception. I'm out there taking speakers and cables and running back and forth trying to set up for the reception. I, I didn't know what to do. So some of the things I was doing at that first wedding were things I was actually doing at my church. And so I just took that same mindset and started doing it with, at weddings. So I'm like, you know, here we go. Y'all ready for this? Y'all want to, you know, I, I didn't know. I, I had no idea what I was doing. And I'm literally not trying to sound preachy. It was literally the grace of God that got me by the first two years. Karaoke was the first gig ever. The wedding was the first tragedy ever. <laughs> My first, oh shit. My first wedding. I remember that. I introduced, <laughs> uh, I don't remember doing a whole lot of MC work initially, especially at, at that wedding specifically. I don't remember talking a whole lot, probably because when I did talk, it was so horrendous because I introduced the, uh, I introduced the bride and groom to their first dance together as husband and wife. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Oh, I can't remember her name now, but I introduced him as Scott. The tragedy is his name was Steve. His name was Steve. And I introduced him to Scott. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, and it's, it was, and at that point, I'm not good on my feet. I'm okay on my feet. I mean, I've been in front of crowds since I was probably 13. I mean, stages never bothered me. That wasn't the issue. But getting around a faux pas like that was new. So I wasn't sure how to get out of it. And I talked over it, smoothed it over. They were okay. It was hilarious and tragic all at the same time. I don't know if the company had to give a refund. They should have because <laughs> that was bad. Um, but it was, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was not fun. Um, but I don't remember it being so tragic that I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I done had a couple of bad gigs. I done had some bad gigs. Let me see, like I've had a gig that the gig wasn't bad, but something bad happened. And what was crazy, I had, I had just ordered my new speakers. They was on the way. That was the last gig I was gonna have with that receiver <laughs> that I was gonna use. I was doing this team party off Highway 15 in some, some little building, let's see. It was at a Shriners Lodge, it was at a lodge. So the party was packed, it was about, it was about 300 teams in there. The floor was sweating, the walls were sweating in there, there were so many people in there. And my, my, it could, I actually couldn't get loud enough. I couldn't, I couldn't get it loud enough. I, had, I, was, I was peaking. I was completely peaking. There were so many, you know, people in there. I was playing uh, first name, last name, that song. They, was, they had their little line dance going all the way around the thing. And it was first name, last name. Done. Receive a blow, smoke, over. <laughs> It wasn't a bad gig because it was fun. I was having a great time though with the kid. How, how far into? Oh, uh, about an hour <laughs> and a half. It was on the, it, I was, and I was looking like, oh shit, like what the hell happened? And I was looking and I was like, I seen my receiver, it was just, it was smoking. Cause I was pushing it all the way to, I was pushing it all the way to the end. And it was just like, click, oh. And everybody was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh hell, oh hell, what I'm gonna do? And it was a guy, it was a guy, the guy who was over it. It was like these little, it was a high school party. It was called a Kappa League or whatever. The guy was over it, he knew a DJ. I still don't know what DJ this dude is, but he was right, he was down the street though. And we ran over to his house, <laughs> got a little, some type of rig he had. It probably was from the 70s or something, hooked up some, some speakers and finished the party. And, but the kids never left. And it was a, had to have been an hour of dead time. They just around just, just fellowshipping. Next thing you know, time back on the speakers, he had sound like shit, everything. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible. But I mean, we went, we went through, we got it through, and I was just like, oh my God, that, that, yeah, that hurt. I'm at work. I get a phone call from a popular DJ here in Chattanooga. Couldn't pick up an event. So I'm like, all right, cool, that ain't no problems. It's um, early Saturday, it was Saturday. Um, I'm like, okay, well, I, I'm looking at this playlist. I am not familiar with none of this music. 
at all. Get to the event, they have the ceremony, it was off campus, the reception was at Loose Cannons. So we knocked out the first dances, the father daughter, and all that kind of stuff, and I'm just kind of playing some general music during dinner. Come time to party, I'm falling flat on every song I play. But it was more of a trap event than what I was expecting. These people wanted unedited versions of this. They wanted, un they, they wanted the grimy, the dirty, what I thought was grimy and dirty at the time. So I'm thinking to myself, this don't, this, not, this don't feel comfortable to me. Right. Looking back on it, that playlist was nothing but future. And at the time, I'm not familiar with any of that because I didn't listen to that. I was, a, I, I was Missy Elliott and Timbaland and right. just dance music. After it's over with, I know I didn't do a good job. And the look on their faces told me I didn't do a good job. So I, was, I left feeling so bad, and I, you know, there was no words to describe that. And I remember Sunday, I didn't go to church the next day. I just felt like, man, this is just, and, and, and I, I just felt like crap. And from that day forward, I made up in my mind I was going to do two things, never be unprepared and um, never take an event that wasn't, second, that wasn't in my skill set. This is the worst event ever. It was a wedding in Knoxville at a golf and country club. The bride gave me a list of songs to play. I took the list as a list of suggestions, right? These are the songs we like, work them in, thanks so much, you're the best. About four songs in, she comes up to me and says, this is not on my playlist. I'm, I don't know what I'm playing, but whatever is on the, she knew the list that she gave me well enough to know that the song that I was playing was not on that list. She wanted that list specifically. Mm. The worst party ever. I said, are you sure? Yes. She may have said even in that order, which is horrible. And I was there mixing the songs the way she wanted. She wanted those songs played. And I played those songs. And even the guests came up. Can you play? I think Cha Cha Slide was the suggestion at that point. I said, Bride doesn't want it. She wants these songs and these songs only. And they said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Worst event ever. There's some bad ones. There's, <laughs> in, in 15 years, there's some bad ones. What's your performance like once you actually get behind the decks? Uh, they can expect a lot of dancing, a lot of good blending, um, scratching now. Uh, I don't know. I guess I guess you just come to have fun, you know. I'm not really trying to be the center of attention, but just trying to make sure that your that your event is successful, that you have a great event. Yeah, that's my primary focus on the customer. That the customer have a great experience. It really, it, it's honestly, it's the party. It's whoever I'm performing for. If I feel their energy. I can I can build myself up to be the MC of the show as well as be the music maker because equipment can hide you but if you've got lights on you and you've got people looking at you you've got to be on stage you've got to be able to perform it varies it varies because like at the Eagle I don't have to do all that at the Club Cabaret I was behind a wall uh, Missy B's I was in a DJ booth at that time I did kind of do a little bit of a show then at Coyote Jacks or Living Room. Um, the, the DJ booth was so high that you really didn't see over it, but they weren't there for a show. They're just there to dance. It, it depends on your crowd. If you've got a dull crowd, you try to, to build them up. You try to get them excited. And, you know, like with me, for instance, perfect example was when I DJed at Regan's Place. I have all these stage lights on me at all times. It's never a part when I'm in the dark. They're, they're looking at you because the video screens are right behind you. So they're looking at the videos, but at the same time, they see you. So... I would be real animated. I'd bring like drumsticks or I would bring, I'd wear like stupid hats or I'd brought like Elton John glasses, things like that. And like, for instance, um, I would bring my drumsticks and then like pretty, I'd play like uh, everybody's working for the weekend. And I would do, I would literally like be animated and do whatever. And people just watched it because they was like, what is he going to do next? When I've got a, an exciting crowd, I, it, it, it feeds, it feeds my, excitement, but at the same time, it feeds into them. So that it keeps them happy. I think client and DJ should have the same type of fun. Because if I'm trying to adjust to your fun, then I'm not gonna be, a, I'm not doing a good job. If I know a, if I know a client and I, we see eye to eye on what, what they really want for their wedding day, they want family oriented music, they want their whole family engaged and involved. They just don't want the younger people out there. They want 
all they want the, the total experience in the first half, maybe just family oriented, easy kind of stuff. In the second half, you are now married. She wants to back that thing up on her husband. That's when we go from window to the wall is what I like to say. So um, we should you should see eye to eye with your client. It's like any other relationship, you know, and then when you build a relationship with that client, with the bride and groom on the wedding day, it makes it even more fun because you've, you've communicated, you've got a relationship with them. And, you know, you leave at the end of the night, you like you're, you're excited and you're happy for them in addition to, you know, getting a paycheck, getting paid. But um, yeah, it's vital that client and DJ have the same fun. For my entertainment style, it's it's that chameleon DJ kind of a thing. You have to, you're the, you adapt. The DJ adapts. Is about knowing who they are. Knowing, knowing my audience. And that happens ahead of the gig. Sit down, talk. Figure out who this person is, who this couple is, who this client is. And even at that point, that's them. All right, cool. We're going to contour this event to you guys because it's your wedding day. Everybody's going to know it's your music. If it's low key, I'm gonna be low key. If you need hype, I'm 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 gonna be hype. I'm gonna bring it, and then I can mold. I can meld into that groove and be that chameleon, to where it drives the party, but it doesn't become the party. It needs to be what they need. I don't need the attention. I'm I'm already there. I know what I'm here for. I know what I'm capable of. They need the best night of their life. So what kind of events do you DJ the most? Um, mostly get LGBTQ events. I mean, I like those because I know the music that we like, um, and I can, I can work better with our community because it, it, that's what I'm used to. Um, a lot of the straight community, they, I, I, I do their parties and I do this, but it's mostly all hip hop. And it's like, when you get those ones that want dance music in a hip hop party, it's like, what do I do? Do I play the music? Do I not play the music? Do I find a happy medium? Like re drums are always a good thing because it, it's the original song, but it's got it's just got a, a now a, a dancier beat to it. I prefer doing like circuit parties and dance parties where it's I'm actually a DJ and not a, a jukebox with fingers, sure. because a jukebox with fingers I mean you can you can get away with it, but that's not what the years of, of blood, sweat, and tears that I put into is paying for. Nowadays, probably personal parties. Cause it ain't that many, you know, it's not that many clubs no more. So, you know, earlier I started off with, I did a lot of weddings and then it went to clubs. I did a whole lot of clubs, you know, club, wedding, club, wedding, clubs, clubs, clubs. And then it went, now it's gone down to more like personal events, you know, family reunions, birthday parties, um, all that type of stuff, yeah. I've never did a prom. I'm not into kid events no more, man. I mean, I know they pay good though, but I'm just not into them no more, man. Like, I was at that one and they just, kids went crazy. So I ain't doing this no more. <laughs> I don't do no kid events, dude, unless I talk to somebody's parents. You know what I mean? I have to talk to your mom or dad or somebody who's gonna be chaperoning. That's, that's, that's the only way. Other than that, just straight kid parties or teen parties. Can't do it. Wedding is a borderline ministry for me. Like I really, I really enjoy it. It does something for me personally to see families come together. As a family man, I'm, I'm family oriented. I love families and, and, and pro marriage, obviously. Um, been married 15 years in April. I love you, girl. Um, so yeah, I just want, I wanted families to come together. So I, that's why I, I promote myself as a wedding DJ. I do like public events because they make you a, a better DJ. Shout out to Southside Social, Embargo 62, Chattanooga Cigar Club, all three of those places because they make me a better DJ. When I first started, I was uh, just trying to entertain and do all that stuff. I had to go back and learn how to actually DJ. So just learning um, how to actually cut and how to scratch, how to beat juggle and just some basic DJ fundamentals. Uh, what I thought was basic, but come to find out a lot of guys can't even transition well or beat match. I had no idea. I don't care if you use a sync button or not, it doesn't matter. You should be at least transition from song to song, which was a big deal for me. But those places playing in public make me a better wedding DJ. So if I see a crowd at the cigar club and this crowd reminds me of what, uh, and I see that same crowd at a wedding, I'm gonna play at the cigar club there. Southside Social, I'm gonna play that for that crowd because it reminds me of that. If 
I'm at a, a predominantly Hispanic wedding, me playing at Embargo 62 makes me up to date on salsa music, reggaeton, and all that. So I'm, uh, you know, it just makes me more well-rounded for weddings. The most, now, arenas. If you broke it all down, I guess you'd have to say corporate events. Because corporate events encompass so much. Holiday parties, so whether it's a high school and we're doing a prom, whether it's, uh, whether it's an apartment complex, we're doing a pool party, whether it's the university, we're doing basketball games. Um, doing games for high schools. I mean, doing games for, for other universities, Kennesaw State, App State. The UTC thing is a big deal. Um, hashtag UTC official DJ. So yeah, with that one entity, it's about 30, 35 events. We average about 40 weddings a year. There's so much you can do as a DJ. There's so many events that you can be a part of. And, and now I'm to the point where I actually have help. DJ Kev is doing his thing. Um, so the company itself, yeah, a couple hundred, couple hundred events a year. And even at that point, I'm working every other weekend. Jen Baby said, hey, you need to spend time with your kids. And so we have the ability now where I can take every other weekend off. I think that's the whole point of DJing is that being able to be all things to all people within that time frame, within that time construct. You got four hours. Do the thing. Be that guy. And that's what we do. How do you decide on what music you're going to play? Pretty much. I, you know, I ask like, even though like I was telling you, I didn't have like three fifty of birthday parties in a, in a row. Even though that they all different, I still ask each person what, you know, what are you, what feel are you on? You know, you know, I'm trying to ask those people, what, what feel do you want for this event? Like, and most of the time they tell me, you know, we want straight old school or we just want a, mis a mixture of this and that. Or we want whatever they want. And I just go from there pretty much. And I, I get there, I read the crowd, throw some feeling music out there to see if they feeling that, see what type of, you know, scan the room, see what the vibe is. See if, you you know, you got a drinking crowd, somebody who's gonna have a lot of fun or you got, you gonna have chair dances tonight. You know, you might have that. So my biggest thing I had to learn was, you know, not don't get discouraged by people that's just sitting, you know, in that chair. Cause sometimes, you know, us as DJs, we want to see everybody on the floor. We want to see everybody on the floor, want to see everybody having a good time. But I had to learn that sometimes people told me, you know, that they had the best time of their life and they didn't get out, didn't get out the chair. You know, I was like, you in the chair the whole time. Like, <laughs> you didn't even dance. You didn't do nothing. But, you know, they was like, love the music or something like that. And I gave away so many cards by people just, you know what I'm saying, just who was in the chair, just chilling. So other than the people that are just, you know, scrubbing the ground. So, like. <laughs> I always ask. Um, in the beginning, when, when I do a three-phase comp, I do a three-phase contract um, negotiation. At first, you know, you come to me, you tell me what you want. I say yes or no, I give you a price. If we negotiate on that price, then it's, and it's fair. Then the next meeting is we get, I, I request um, song requests, or if there's special things you want me to do, um, equipment needs, things like that. And then the last meeting is finalizing details. If there's things that have changed, if there's more music to be requested, because I like to have at least two weeks to 30 days to if i need to download special music same thing with weddings weddings you know it's the same thing with weddings you know you get together with the bride and groom you talk about their i always talk about the venue because that plays a big part into you know equipment that's being needed you know lights that are requested if i have to provide atmosphere lights because they're you know they're like if it's in a barn you've got to provide their atmosphere lights as well as your dance floor lights um, you know, there is more money that's involved in that because there's also insurance involved because, you know, if something gets broken or God forbid we have a tornado and it comes and blows everything away, you know, there's things that has to, the, the financial stuff is always discussed first and, you know, discuss their needs. You know, we need to find out when they're getting married or, um, what they have in mind. And sometimes I even help out and do a little bit of helpful wedding planning with them because I've done so many. I know what works with this. I've known what, what's done with this scenario, you know, and then I, I then we have the, the uh, request list. I send them home with homework, you know, make your request list, your request, his request, and then y'all's request. And if there's anything else that may need to be added into it, and then um, 
because I never, I never like to deal with uh, psycho bride. You know, I try to make everybody happy. You know, and if there's going to be young children, you got to keep in mind if they want this specific music, you got to play clean versions. You know, you know whether they're okay with them hearing those that, those words or not. I don't because I have children and I want that. I, I wouldn't want that to be part of their life. You know, whether your parents want to do it or not, because it's a bearing on my company. If I'm playing a 90s, late 90s, early 2000s mix, you know right where I'm at. You see everybody, we are all right here. All right, you know, we, we, we doing our thing. That is not the time to come play something. The baby Shark is not being played right there as a joke. So I've had to tell people, no, that, that, that doesn't fit, do better. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm serious. Like, nah, man, that ain't cool enough. I need you to give me something better than that. I don't even take requests at weddings. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Do not come up to me requesting a song if you are not the bride and groom or the parents. Okay. Do not because there's a certain, in my mind, I know what I'm doing. I know what I want to do, how I want to control the crowd, how I want to take them up and bring them back down, and then act silly for a minute, and then bring them back up again. I know it's structured already in addition to the playlist that I got from the bride and groom. Uh, then I'm looking around the crowd and see if there's an older crowd. I'm, I'm doing a lot right now. So what I don't need are requests right now. All right, let me preface this with saying that every style of music is usable in just about every event. A lot of it goes into who you see. And not just who you see, but how they react. Cocktail and dinner, a lot of people dismiss. A lot of DJs actually put on a pre-mixed mix and they walk away. They just think this is what, they just want background, everybody wants to talk. To a point, yes, that is correct. Everybody wants to talk. You don't need to be super loud, you're not taking over, and that's fine. But you miss a lot in that hour and a half. When it comes to a wedding, you get dinner and cocktail. You get an hour and a half of reading people and what they groove to. What do they like? What don't they like? Like you can play something and you'll know instantly if they don't like it. You'll play something else and you're like, okay, all right. Some of it you can read, okay, liquor's kicking in. Some of it is like this lady will dance to anything. It does not matter. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about her. She's fine. So picking out what I play, if it's my set, if it's something that I get to play, I'm going to play everything because that's just who I am. I grew up that way. Between Cool and the Gang, Eagles, Seals and Crofts, Chicago, and then I get to pick my own music. Growing up in the 90s, you had everything. It's the 90s. We're latchkey kids. We're up to all kinds of shit when they're not around. And then when you end up having that repertoire, you have, and you don't have to memorize the songs. You don't have to know them. Memorizing the feel of the songs is probably more important. Because you'll know what you'll need in a moment when it comes to DJing. It's like, oh, this isn't going to work. This will. And after you do it for 15 years, like, fuck yeah, this will. <laughs> you, there's no hesitation. I like 70s funk, CCR. I like the boy band era. Jagged Edge and 112. Uh, believe it or not, I, NSYNC and all that. Nelly, Diddy, I like DMX, Rough Riders. Bruno, Bruno, I need an album every month. Well, I'll play whatever, but the music that I normally like to listen to is I like, um, you know, um, Alternative rock. It's kind of weird because you'd think somebody like myself would be like, I'm all into RuPaul, Hey Girl, and I'm like, then you're like, really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if it's just me, it depends on the mood I'm in. Yeah, growing up, hip hop, R&B, awesome. Rock, flair, funk is dope. EDM music around, it's not so much the style of music that I like to play, it's the BPM that I like to play. Anywhere from 92 to about 108, that kind of BPM. You can have it all. Uh, rap and R&B. Yeah, rap and R&B more so than anything. Day of an event. Jeez. Oh. Yeah, for my preparation, it's, it, it went from freaking out and, and doing a lot of extra stuff, and, and now it's just I just walk in and just set up. Before, it was I would stress out because I was like, I, I wanted to make sure that everything was working. I do, you know, go do the fine-tuning stuff, and, and, and that was younger. That was in my... my first 10 years of DJing, um, actually the first 15 years really, to be honest with you. And then I finally just said, you know what, take a breath, just think about what you're doing, you know, you know your equipment, turn it on, work it, whatever. Because I've had a situation where I've had numerous hard drives that have crashed right before or during, um, where I had to freak out because, you know, I, and I made that mistake of having a lot of music and bringing it all with me and not having a backup. So I learned my lesson from that. So, you know, computers are, computers and electronics 
they have their own mind. They, they go down when they want to. It's not, you can make it go down, but it's gonna go, if it's gonna go, it's gonna go, and it don't care what, it, it screw your feelings. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had turntables that have, I've had no, uh, I've had the stylus go off, like literally fly off. Right. I've had uh, CD players in the hundreds that have just decided they either skipped or they, they stopped playing and it's just, it's, it's embarrassing. So that's why I switched over from doing analog to digital, digital to, you know, computer digital media, because I did, didn't want to carry crates and crates and crates and crates of music around. And then, then I had books of CDs. Now I can, I have backups, but I carry a hard drive, a computer, my controller, and if I have to bring sound and lights, I bring those as well. So now for me to just prepare for a gig, it's just, is everything working? Is everything okay? And then when I get there, I mean, I know my equipment, it takes me at most 20 minutes to set up. Um, if I've got lights, maybe 45 minutes, depending on what I've got. Um, sound, literally to plug everything in, I'm ready to go in 25 minutes. If I'm plugging into a club, I, wanna, I always do a sound check, I always make sure, I get there early enough to do a sound check when there was nobody there, turn it up to full and, and, and you know, play a few songs just to test their equipment because um, there's been in times past where I have uh, shown up and their subs didn't work. And they didn't even bother to tell me. They knew they were out, they'd been out for weeks. Didn't tell me their subs were not working. So the sound sounded like shit, but luckily enough, um, a, another DJ friend of mine brought some subs in so that it didn't sound like shit. If you have anything going on whatsoever and you wait till the day of to get your shit together, everything hits the fan. So if you want good karma, prepare the night before. Just OG advice, get everything together, get ready to go. I still get nervous before a show. I still get antsy. I still get that energy before any kind of an event, really. But the prep work is done. I mean, you get your speakers, start with those, and then you work everything else in, pack the truck. You know what your timeline is like, but it's not so all-consuming that the downside with the beginning of it is it's all-consuming for 48 hours, which takes that away from your family. You can't have real good family time if you got a gig, if it's going to take that kind of attention away. It's not fair. That's not right. It's justified with the event. Sure. You want, to be, you want it to go well. You want them to be satisfied. You're working for money for, after all. So you want it to be good. But it comes at such a great sacrifice to your kids that they're not getting your attention because you're so distracted. Think about a set list. Think about a song. Think about an edit. Do I actually have a clean version of that song that they actually requested? Oh. <sighs> Do that prep work, get it done early so it doesn't take up all that time. Um, now it's, it's equally as energetic, but it's all in a day at this point. Spend my days during the week getting prepped, getting ready, having my meetings, understanding what they want, knowing how to get there, what to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's old hat as far as that's concerned. Um, but it's, it's gotten to a point where it's easier to manage both the family and the business to where one doesn't suffer for the other. Because I've spent so much time with my kids in the past, show up late to a gig, not have everything I need, even call home, you know. <laughs> hey, I forgot my lights. <laughs> so finding that balance was, was critical and, uh, and better for everybody, honestly. But... Yeah, back in the day, it was it was nerve wracking. Gig day, uh, I basically I hardly ever eat. <laughs> <laughs> I should eat. I say I'm gonna eat every time, but I, I never do. Uh, I guess I'm a perfectionist to a certain extent. I always try to make sure every my computer is good, everything is working. Uh, packing up the car. Uh, let's see. I'm on, I got my headphones on, I'm listening, I'm getting my playlist together, I'm making sure everything is good, it's what the client wants, and you know, drive, I'm an hour early to every event, gotta make sure I'm an hour early at least. Um, 
set up. And like I said earlier, uh, feel the music, you know, try to fill out the crowd, see what the crowd want to do that night, and then just pretty much just go from there. It's preparation for the first two hours before I even leave the house. During football season, it's tough, and I'm a, a huge college football buff, so I have to mentally remind, my, remind myself, put your phone down, you're at an event. Uh, and Saturday, we talk about Saturdays. Saturdays, uh, usually, you know, you wake up and uh, you're getting yourself dressed, you're, getting, you're cleaning up, you're cutting, I'm, me, I'm gonna cut my hair, uh, get my shower, get my outfit situated, uh, make sure I got my, um, the playlist that they gave me, make sure that's in order, double checking emails, double checking the remaining balance for the event, um, the notes that I've taken with the bride and groom, going over those and crossing them out, making sure I have this, this, and this. My daughter is 14, my son is 11, and my youngest just turned six. So the 11 year old and the six year old, my boys don't really remember the struggle period. Unfortunately, my daughter does remember us being evicted and having to live in hotels and the whole nine. So to them, what I'm doing is life. Dad is getting ready to go to work. Dad is about to go make some, my youngest, uh, you about to go make some money, ain't your dad? Yeah, we're gonna make some money, you know? That's our little phrase, man don't work, man don't eat. You know, you, you know so as, as I'm leaving the house on a Saturday, um, my wife makes sure, that, uh, makes sure that I'm mentally relaxed because I have a tendency of getting in a rush and, and now I walk out the house, go, left my laptop. Go back in the house, I go, oh crap, where's my, uh, and, then, and she'll be, you know, she's always helped me out and making sure I, I stay level-headed. And I'll try to get to events three to four hours before time. I wanna get there way too early and get everything set up and get everything prepped and get ready to go, get my backup plans together, contact other DJs and say, hey man, where you at? Just in case something happens. Um, you know, weather issues, you know, the whole nine. So yeah, I try to get there way too early, get confident, uh, get comfortable, go get dressed, freshen up and look presentable for what's about to take place. You know, and, and that's, it's just, it does play on you mentally because you, you have to be, like I said, the most confident person in the room you meeting other vendors that you may not have met before, or you got some that you, you know, your favorites. And so you know, you, you have to meet them and find out what you want to do. When are we doing this? So we get there, you know, you're talking to the coordinator, talking to uh, the photographer, the videographer, the caterers, you know, just making sure that everything is prepped and ready to go. And hopefully that, you know, their, their mindset's the same as yours and that, that they want to be able to provide the bride a, you know, a great service. So it's just, it's a lot of preparation. When you're getting your bookings, do you aim for stuff that you would want to do or if somebody is coming to you with a check i'm going to find a way to make that part of work yeah i find a way to make it happen i feel like i can find a way to make it happen um i like a challenge so you know sometimes you gotta i mean that's part of djing really to me you know, sometimes you gotta step out of your comfort zone and do something different you know what i mean i did a co-worker's wedding and it was up in, let's see, where the hell was that at? Ray County, I think. <laughs> yeah, I did his wedding and it was like, different. <laughs> Super different. But the people, but the people was, uh, the people were, it, it was, let's see. It probably was about four black people there. <laughs> The people was, was like, I mean, but they got drunk as hell. They had like moonshine at the wedding. They had, yeah, they had a big, like a big jug of moonshine, like three different kinds, beer. It's all kind of stuff. It was just, it was just completely different. And you know, when I looked in the room when, there, when people were walking in, I was just like, oh shit. I was like, this, <laughs> this is about to be the longest Longest, you know how it is, man. When you in you in a situation, you just like, oh man, this is about to be the worst. The yeah, this is about to be the longest four hours in my life. But like I always do, I just saw throwing stuff out there, and I seen people vibing to it, and so I knew what lane to go in, and I pretty much just stuck in a country pop, old school eighty. <laughs> type stuff and I was just hitting them with all that type of stuff and they had a ball I had fun I had some moonshine and everybody was merry yeah. <laughs> merry everybody had fun man so at first I looked at that vineyard just was like this ain't gonna be it they're gonna be looking at me like I'm crazy but it worked out and it was cool we had fun 
Here goes nothing. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I take what's in my skill set. Like boxers choose certain boxing matches before they fight certain, I do the same thing. We love country music, uh, 80s pop. Um, nope. The uh, late 50s, uh, um, Jam, nope. Uh, we into line dances, current hip hop music, family friendly, clean music. There we go. Like I said, do I, I, and I take events that are customized to my skill set. It's intentional. You know, you know, you want to be somewhere where, where people won't receive you. I, I don't mind marketing myself as a, as a wedding DJ. I don't. Um, because I don't fit in the clubs. I'm not a club DJ and it's every, and now, what, every DJ has a specific area where they shine. The first thing that alerts me when I meet a, D, a, a guy, oh, I can DJ, I can do this, I can DJ that, I can do that, no. And I get, that's, to me, that's a red flag. And the reason why that's a red flag, because you and I both know, it's tough to shine in every one. One has got to be your bread and butter. My bread and butter are weddings, uh, corporate events, and some family functions. That's where I shine at. And so that's why I try to make sure I stay, you know, in my wheelhouse, in, my, in what's comfortable for me. If something comes my way and I'm not confident with it, I'll shoot it to another guy. Right. You know, because we should all, I mean, well, I, I try to focus on my skill set and my strengths. Um, family reunions, I don't do those too well. You know, this is not, it's not, no. Any type of reunion, no. The reason why, I'm an entertainer. I like to entertain. I like to have a great time. Usually at reunions, it's a bigger fish. You know, people walking around talking, it's socializing, and I don't want to take from my family to play music while you walk around talking. You know, I, I'm not enjoying this, you know. I mean, I'll do whatever. I mean, I have my favorites. But then, you know, recently I've done the eighth grade dance at LMS um, at Lakeview Middle School. And I did it. I've done it two years in a row. And some of the kids, wow. Yeah. You wouldn't think that eighth graders would ask for music that we play in a nightclub. But, yeah, it, I, I couldn't find clean versions for half the songs they've asked for. And, you know, it's just one of those things that's, do I play it? Do I don't? Because kids don't care. They could care less about your feelings. They screw your feelings. I want to hear this song. And then when you go and ask one of the chaperones, it's like, what do I do? As, as a, a person that owns an entertainment company, at, you know, I own Amulet Entertainment Group. So my, my company, I'm not just for the LGBTQ community. I'm for... I'm business, you know, it would, if somebody asked me to do uh, a corporate event at Blue Cross Blue Shield, yeah, and, and I'm going to compete with my, I'm going to compete with my other companies, you know, I'm going to say, hey, bring me, bring me something from another company and I'll compete with it. I mean, sometimes I can't. I've made some sacrifices before where, you know, a, one DJ said $1,200 and I said $800. Well, then I get there and I find out why they charge $1,200 because of all the stuff that they were asking for but it created a relationship that I can work with. Because now, if, if they see the effort that I've put forth, and you know, I gave them all that extra, if I was to charge extra next time, they see why. They're not just saying, oh well, you know, it was cute, but let's not do that again. <laughs> Whatever is needed. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me really what, uh, what kind of event it is. Uh, I'll play anywhere, I've played everywhere. Um, the original slogan for my company was any party, any time. So kind of having that background, when you're playing songs that other people have written, other people have sung, other people have recorded and mixed, <laughs> and make other people feel good, those other people that feel good when you play those songs, that's your client. It's my client. That's DJ Scuba Steve's client, whether it's a wedding, whether it's a corporate event, whatever it may be. What makes the DJ I think versatility, being able to move any room. If you, you know, you can be in a, mo a room for black people, for white people, for whatever. You know, if you can move that room. And I think that that's what make you the best. I think that's what's, you know, uh, blending too, all that stuff aside. You know, blending, uh, mixing, you know, however you can, move that room i think that's what defines you what would make you you know better i think that's 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 big to me somebody that has that that plays for his crowd or her crowd um they have to you know it's all about content you don't have if you're if you know in advance that you're playing hip-hop music then you want to make sure that you have all forms of hip-hop trap r&b rap 
hip hop, um, twerking music and all that. But you got to be able to accommodate for your crowd and then, you know, also make room for, you know, those oddballs that come walking in saying, I want to hear this or like they want to hear a little boozy and you don't have a little boozy, but you got to be able to get it. You know, every, because most places now have internet access, so they, you can either do it through your phone, you know, or you, the, the club has Wi-Fi. You just have to know your content and know your crowd, because if you don't know your crowd, then there's really no reason for you to be a DJ, because if you're just playing for yourself, do it in your house. The best DJ in my mind is the DJ that can read the room. It's music. Music is psychology. Psychology is music. DJing is psychology. If you don't know that, learn that because that's what it is. If you're a carpenter, you need a good hammer. If you're a DJ, you need good gear. Beyond that, what are you doing with the gear? Are you building a shack or a cathedral? The DJ that knows his room the fastest and plays it well, that's, that's the best DJ. You know, I listen to different DJs constantly. I pretty much grew up listening to, to mix DJ. You know, he, he did the the whole note and uh, the guard parties and all the parties when I was in high school. So that's what I grew up listening to. And then when I went to other places, I used to be like, dang, this DJ whacked, dude. I mean, he ain't <laughs> nothing like the dude we got at home. Like when I went to college, I was like, man, he ain't nothing like the dude at home. I'm a fan of listening to different DJs. I go to different places and listen to different DJs. I mean, you can learn stuff, pick up stuff, and you can also know where you better at, <laughs> what you better at doing, you know. That was before I met Mix, too. Yeah, that was before I met him, you know, and I was just like, damn. I was like, yeah, I, I, I got a whole lot of work to do. I got to get me some different equipment. I mean, that, it motivated me, though, you know what I mean? It was like, I got to get some more equipment. I got to I gotta do that. I need to learn how the hell he did that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, dang, that was dope. I'm friends with a lot. I mean, I just, I really don't have a specific. I mean, I love Kazmir Ray. He's a good friend of mine. Danny Williams. Russell Snyder, who used to be the DJ at, at Allen Golds. Um, Roger Stoddard, Ranny, um, Tony Moran, you know, uh, Barry Harris. Those people that I listed off, I mean, all those people I'm friends with. That's cool. But as far as um, just a specific, no, not really. Because you, you're not really a DJ until you've done weddings, until you've done those, those corporate parties until you've done all that because it, it kind of it humbles you as a D, as a DJ because just because you're locked in that DJ booth and you can tell people that you're not taking remix that you're not taking requests and you're not doing this when you're at a party or if you're at a wedding that's all it is is a request and if you don't take those requests you're not going to get paid or you're not going to get asked back to do anything else so all those DJs that, that call themselves, you know, I, I can do this, I can do that, and they use that auto mix. Well, I'm here to tell you, you better learn how to mix because there's going to be point, there's going to be points in time where you're going to have to do a party, or you're going to have to, you know, a, a bachelorette party or a wedding. Or I've done an Indian wedding once. That was fun. That was three days of, wow. It, it you learn you learn real quick that. They're they're specific. No, yeah, it's it's funny growing up watching watching DJs, Grandmaster Flash, Kid Capri, and Spinderella. Watching those DJs do DJ shit. It's like watching Eddie Van Halen play guitar, and then you think that you can play guitar. It's that. It's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that shit. If that's guitar playing, it ain't for me. You're talking about DJ Icon, Scratch Bastard, Cubert. And, and all those dudes are great, especially locally. I mean, talk about Space Ghost. He was the guy forever. DJ Mix, same way. Um, watching him go from table to table is awesome. Every time. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, the dude's lights out. Um, DJ D Strict, probably, probably the Denzel Washington of DJs. Just that smooth, just that smooth approach uh, to what he's doing. So that's that's always fun to watch, too. Oh, geez, I'm, Daniel Weaver's been doing it for 30 years. So, you know peeping that trying to figure out what makes that longevity work especially coast to coast i mean kansas city i mean he's been everywhere so so see, seeing that success uh is really cool to watch the technique uh the cool to watch and then and then watching the new guys come through like keenan and shy city and and seeing them do what they do and how they do it um but as far as favorites go uh dj jim baby first close second dj jazzy jeff I look at DJs all the time just to see what they're doing, what's going on, what they look like, what they dress like, what they, uh, what are they offering? Uh, some guys in uh, Atlanta doing like like drums. They bring a drummer, um, 
and a saxophone player or something. They have somebody playing with them as their, which which is extra. You know that kind of stuff. It's just so you're looking at just making sure that you stay relevant, making sure that you're not dated uh, with your services and things like that. But as far as having a favorite DJ, um, I'm gonna say no. I do have some favorite businessmen. DJing is just the beginning for me. I, you know, if if the if the Rock had just kept wrestling, that'd have been a bad decision for him. If if Will Smith had just kept rapping, that would have been a bad decision for him. But these things that they did first is what got them out there. Then you branch off into something maybe a little more lucrative or something that's net to your your natural skill set. You know who you are as a person. So um, I've always said I was a better businessman than I was DJ. I don't really study the whole DJ thing that much. I respect the craft to the point where I want to stay caught up with what you know my with some basic skill sets. Um, I respect music the whole nine. I do. I, I admiration and respect for it. However, I see myself long term doing something more like that. That's more my speed. That's what I'm more comfortable with. I just, I love standing in front of people with a microphone. Mm. The non-DJ world, what do you guys need to know? Be respectful. There's a lot of time to go into it. It's something that you work at. It's something you put time into. It's something that you practice. Well, I want to be known as a great businessman. Our job is already hard enough because we have to keep um, the crowd happy and you're not always going to play the perfect song. You know, you may come up and request something and you know, you want to hear it. There's a list of, of things that DJs go through each, each night, and, it, and it, you know a lot of people make fun of that and they laugh at it. But you know what? It's real stressful for us because if you've got a, a room full of people and three people are dancing, you gotta you gotta figure out how you're gonna get them on the floor. And uh, you got that one song, and you got that other song. That one song is gonna get them on the floor, and then you got that other song is gonna send them away. You know, and not every single song has to be an uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. The bar is open to sell drinks. You've got to be able to know, bring them up, bring them down, bring them up, bring them down. And if you, you may not like every single song the DJ plays and okay, you come up and request a song. If we don't have it or we have no way to get it, you know, you got to be, you know, don't be an asshole about it. You know, we, we've got a hard enough job. We don't go to your 7-Eleven and request a flavor of Slurpee that you don't have. I'm sorry, I want to have watermelon. You don't have watermelon, how dare you? Or we don't go to your office complex, walk up to your desk and say, I'm sorry, I don't like the job that you're doing or the blouse that you're wearing. I'm sorry, you need to change that. You know, we, we're, we're paid to do a job. We've been given instructions by the manager or the owner of what things we can get away with and what things not to play, absolutely not to play. And if there's, there's, there's no, uh, no discussion session, you know, there's that no discussion section, but you know, at the end of the day, yes, they are, they're paying the bills, but also there's a point where you have to pull back and say, listen, you know, I can't, I, I can't, I'm sorry. You, you can go speak to the manager. If the manager tells me yes, then fine, I'll play it. But if it's a no, it's a no. You know, and then I have to be the asshole because I'm the one that can't play it. But then, you know, I, I try to find a happy medium. Put it in this perspective. For those of you who have any kind of a job, do you practice for that job? What's a good example? What? Shelf stocker at Family Dollar. Do you go home and practice stocking shelves? If you're a DJ, you're not just a DJ. You're a seamstress, a uh, sound tech. You're a gaffer, gaff tape everywhere. Logistics expert. You're a warehouse engineer. You're a packer and loader. And yeah, my bosses change every week. The meetings. I mean, you talk about, yeah, yeah, no, he's got a gig. It's on Saturday. No, I don't. I have a meeting with this bride or corporate sponsor on this week to talk about can you do it yes okay we have an agreement here's a contract boom there's a contract we have to have contracts there's legal that's involved insurance that's involved um and so that's your initial meeting initial consultation then you have a follow-up consultation this is where we are in our plans come all the way up to wedding week final consultation that meeting then you go to rehearsal i've already made four trips and i haven't even done the event yet where are these four trips downtown Hickson, Cleveland, Knoxville, Atlanta. Where are these at? All that goes into it. And those things aren't cheap. They're not cheap, especially when you add them all up together. Yeah, so for, for people to just dismiss DJs as just these dime a dozen things, I understand what a lot of DJs put out. It's just the bare minimum. But when you research somebody and you call them up, when you call them, 
that's when your respect is due. I want people to know that if they see my name, Keenan Daniels, attached to something, they can associate it with it, or like an Apple product. You see the Apple logo, you're assuming it's gonna perform at a certain level because they have a great reputation. And that's what I want people to know about me, is the fact that if you see the Million Dollar Man logo on there, or if you see the Keenan Daniels logo on there, understand that this, this event is it's about to be, it's gonna be somewhat glamorous, it's gonna be done in excellence, it's, it's gonna be professional, which I think professionalism starts with who you are as a person. I'm everywhere early, I'm everywhere prepared. That uh, I'm dedicated to whatever it is I'm, I'm attached to. Uh, I'm gonna give it everything I got. I'm not gonna shortchange you. Um, I'm, and in most cases, I'm gonna try to give you more than what you paid me for. So I'm learning how to bring out Keenan Daniels a little bit more and leave the million dollar man what that is, you know. It's a lot of time that, that goes into um, you DJing, you know. It's not just you getting up there pressing buttons for the crowd, you gotta make sure that it's a good experience for the people. Um, they should know that you, you're actually coming out cheap by <laughs> getting, by if you know what a DJ has to go through. You, you're constantly buying wires, you're buying lights, you're buying, you, like we said earlier, you got $3,000 worth of speakers I got a three thousand dollar computer. You got a, <laughs> you got a two thousand dollar mixing board. You know, every every wire to your to your speakers. You know, that's that's fifty dollars. This fifty dollars. So it's an investment. You know what I mean? You I mean, and you you're investing in somebody to make sure that your event is good. You should compensate them for that. That's what people need to know. Definitely. They're not begging you for the gig. If they were, it'd be one thing. But they're not. And if they're not, let that man do his work. Or lady. Whichever. <laughs> you know, I hate, uh, like, I hate having to tell somebody no. Like, if I don't have something and I literally search for it and can't find it, um, telling someone no is a big, is a big thing with me. Because I like to be that DJ that will honor requests. Because I always like to make everybody happy. Because that's our job. Um, keep them entertained, you know, and whatever. But... Um, when bar staff or bar management fails to tell you things, when you either in advance or after it's already there, if something is going on, hey, can you get on the microphone and tell people that they need to go move their cars? Are going to be, you know, that's a down, that's a Debbie Downer. That you know that keeps people. It, first of all, it's, it's pissing somebody off because now they have to walk outside. They got to go move their car or they got to do whatever, and they're trying to keep their you try to keep them happy. And no matter what you do, it's like, now it's, screw it, you're done. The only thing I hate is that people either see you one or two ways. Either they think, either they respect the hell out of what you're doing, or they don't think you're doing shit. You know what I'm saying? It's one of the two. Either they, like, they really respect it and they, they really see, some people really see the work that goes into it, and they respect what you're doing, or they don't. It's, it's really no middle ground. It's like they either, they appreciate the hell out of you or they don't. I think a lot of people think that anybody can do that because a lot of people just think you just, like I said, they think you just pressing buttons, like you just playing music, you know, to the regular ear. That's just like a lot of people think that they can go out and do what LeBron James do, you know, because you can't do that. That's just, <laughs> he's a professional at what he do. It's like, you know, and you can't, no regular person can't do what we do either though. I mean, even the fly by night DJ people, they try to, but you, you're you not doing what a professional person is doing. You just not, you haven't put in the time, the, the money, the effort, none of that. So, you know, I just hate that people disrespect it and don't see, you know, don't, don't see what you're really doing, you know. That's the only thing I hate. Eating late. If I'm talking, Steve, I was so physically fit when I back in 2011, 2012, man, uh, before I started, because uh, you had a, you regimented a certain way. This lifestyle, this DJ lifestyle, especially full time, is so all over the place. You never know what you're gonna do. Your schedule is so unpredictable. I can get a phone call here in a minute saying, "Hey, can I meet you in a couple of hours to drop that deposit and cover this contract for something?" You have to go, you know, and you, you literally are always on call. Uh, I had to learn how to balance it. I'm a family man and I'm married. Um, when I first started doing this, there were text messages, phone calls, emails, 
all this going on, I'm thinking to myself, how do you balance all that? You know, I, I want to be at home with my kids, but right now I have to go do something else. And, I, 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 and it affected my marriage for a little while. So we had to communicate and there was some understanding going on, baby. Listen, I got, I'm growing a business here. I need you to support me. Um, learn how to balance everything and get, and, get, and get some structure to my life. You know, so I try not to take phone calls anymore after a certain time. I try, not to, I try to put my phone down and not respond to that email until tomorrow uh, because I'm such a, I'm a responsive person. I like to respond quick to things. So um, that's the only drawback. Uh, just in spending time away from my family, you know, but you're doing it for work, you know, so you have to just have to balance that. We have to have date night, you know, we have to do this, we have to do that. You have to structure your life. And that was something that was new for me. What do I hate about DJ? I hate the vinyl versus digital DJ argument. I hate the sync argument. I don't care what you use. Is the, is the room going to move? Are you dialed into the people? That's, that's what's important. I think I, I think I hate the fakeness more. We can be cordial. We can be professional, but at the same time, I'm not going to give you my secrets. I'm not going to teach you how to DJ. I'm not going to teach you how to be a DJ. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give that advice until I'm done. When I'm done, I'll open up a school and then, yeah, everybody can learn from Scoop Steve. That's fine. But until that day, no, we're in competition. It's a healthy competition. Competition is good. You should want to be better. You should want to get better. I want to be better all the time. But at the end of the day, somebody's going to take somebody else's lunch. Being friends along the way is cool. But there's very few scenarios where you can be in the same zip code and not be in competition. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? I would probably be pushing hosting full time somewhere. You know, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now. I like hosting. That's the, that's, Steve, that's the most fun thing for me is being on stage with a microphone. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Steve Harvey, oh, Steve Harvey, Jimmy Fallon, Ellen DeGeneres, talk show host, um, anything where I can interact with people and, 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 ma and make them feel good, um, game shows, I like stuff like that. Now, I do study that, if anything. I just, I love standing in front of people with a microphone. It's, it's yeah, 500 people, my, oh God. I feel so at home doing that. This is, it's, it's, this is a stepping stone for me. And, and I'm not embarrassed to admit it. I was an arts kid, you know, so I don't think I've, I've done successfully, I like to think is take music theater, take the arts and put it in a DJ. Like I said, do I, I, and I take events that are customized to my skill set. It's intentional. You know, you know, you want to be somewhere where, where people won't receive you. I guess what makes me the prize is, some, I mean, if when people, when people like change the date of their event, just because they want you so bad, you know what I mean? It's like, I'll do this, I'll do whatever. I just need you as my DJ. Yeah, I don't care when it is. I know my birthday on the 13th, but I have it the next weekend, just if you'll be my DJ. So that's, that's, that's always cool. That always, that's always something to make you feel good. Like, yeah, that's cool. The thrill of, of being the person in charge. And I love music. I've always, like again, like I said before, Ever since a baby, I've, I've been enthusiastic about music and how, how, it's produ how it's produced, how it's delivered. I look for dynamics. I look for specific things that, that make me happy in the song. The thing I like the most about the life is being able to call the shots to some point, to some degree. If I don't like your event, if I don't want to be a part of it, I get to say no. I like being able to say I'm not working every other weekend so I can spend time with my kids, my family. The thing I love the most about a fucking event, though, is just that zone. Because you work so hard for it. And the zone is that space where you're playing and everything's working. You're working your music and you know what's coming. You know what you're going to play. And when you play those things, it just seamlessly works. And it's just this flow. And you give it to the audience. And they give it right back. And whether they love it or not, they may not, they may not love... There's something about what you just did. Whether it's the blend, whether it's the mix, or it's the song choice. One of those three things comes into effect. And it probably hits a bunch of people different ways but it all hits them at the same time. 
when that beat drops and that woe moment happens and 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 that's and you get that first one bam yeah mm, ah mm, ah and you're rolling and it's going and it's flowing you drop it in some samples scratch a little bit boom boom drop the next one whoa oh shit and right there you doubt it right there you don't know if it's actually legit and then you hit that third one. Ooh. That third one happens. Then you know you're in the zone. You know you're in that flow. And for the next hour and a half, it's just banger, 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 banger. And it may not be songs that you think are bangers. But you know them, right? You've got your audience. And they've got you. Like, everybody's on that same page. There's nothing better. Nothing. I've learned a lot. Just so much as I've learned, I've took every year and I said I was going to add something to my to my game, do different things, try different things, see how different sounds. So you know, if they're not liking it or if they do like it, you know, I can come out of that quicker, go into something else, or you know, just make that seem like it was a snippet to that or something like that. So you know, if it's bad, I'm I'm quicker to try different things now than I, than I was then, you know. Then I used to be like super scared, like wouldn't, wouldn't scratch in public, wouldn't, some stuff I wouldn't blend. Sometimes I'd be scared to blend certain stuff at a certain time, but yeah, I just go. Yeah, I just go. What about the industry? You seen some changes that stand out? And you see, like we said, it's, like you said, it's DJs popping up everywhere now. And you got a lot of people that don't really respect it, so to so to say. You know, you got people that do different things, and that's not really DJing, but they think it is, or they say it is. So I mean, I guess you know. But I think if you actually hands on DJing, that some of the stuff you don't have time to go do if you. DJing, you know what I mean? If you really, really DJing. I didn't go to clubs. I didn't do any of that. So I was kind of behind an eight ball. I wasn't used to, I'd never seen a wedding DJ until myself. I didn't see anything. I did, like I said, um, when I would go out, there was one guy, Space Ghost. You know, yeah. shout out to you. Uh, I was in high school. I think he was at like Second City or something like that. And uh, I just, I, just heard, I was listening to him play and I was thinking to myself, that, that's pretty darn cool. And, um, so I wasn't really introduced to DJs like that. So I didn't know, like I said, I'm a new kid on the block. I didn't know what was what. I was just looking for an opportunity and um, to try to figure this thing out and just have fun. I had nobody to compare myself to. So I don't know what the industry, the tones were like back then, uh, back in 2012, I had no idea. Um, I think now people are probably wanting more of an experience. Uh, yeah, so I think I hit it at the right time. To try to go in there and probably, and I was told, I'm just things that I was, I've been told by guys who've been in the industry for a while, that things have been shook up now. And I'm not saying I had something to do with that. I like to be known as one of the ones who probably helped uh, change the game up just a little bit, just to shake stuff up. Um, so so th I've seen po po uh, social media posts about people's equipment looking a certain way now, how they dress now has changed, and uh, how they interact with the crowd. Some guys are even hiring hype men. They're hiring entertainers. They're putting together customized dance routines and stuff now and, uh, and all that. So if I would like to, it doesn't hurt me to be named among some of the ones who've helped change things. Locally, it's been cool actually to see the evolution. When I first started, DJs were everywhere. We had Raw, we had Midtown, we had Coltrane's, we had uh, Electric Cowboy, we had The Drink, we had, it was Pulse at that point, Skyzu now, Palms. There were clubs. There were clubs for DJs to play in. I even played Rhythm and, Blue, Rhythm and Brews one time. So the, even, even, the, even the places, 807, uh, Jefferson's, even the places that weren't, necessarily set up for DJs would let DJs play. That wasn't always the case. Before then, it was strictly live bands. And then the DJ wave happened. And that's that maintained probably up to 
I don't know, 2013, 14, maybe. That's that's been the biggest thing in my mind. Just seeing those those ebbs and flows of when live music takes over and then when DJs take over and back and forth. Uh, music has changed. Lifestyles have changed. Um, a lot more uh, people are going out, but they're not going out like they used to. I mean, people. We used to when when we were young, we'd spend two or three hundred dollars and be obliterated. But you know, we didn't get into fights. We didn't get into uh, get thrown in jail. We didn't you know do all this riffraff and stuff. But the music itself went from being fun to being aggressive. You don't have to be on a dance floor to, to give in a reaction. People can stand at the bar and tap their fingers. You know, as long as they're doing that and they're bobbing their head, they're, st- they're enjoying what you're playing. If they're standing around with like this and, you know, they're like mean mugging everybody, you need to change, you need to be the person to change that. You need to give them what they want so that they can stop acting like an asshole, you know, you know, because that's, that's what they're doing is they're, you know, there's just so much that, you know, everybody's always trying to go after the same woman or the same guy. They're, you know, if, and if that girl gives that person attention, then they're going to get in a fight. And then if you try to play something that it's going to be appeasing to everybody that makes them all happy, then, you know, it, it could be a good thing or it could be a completely bad thing. Chattanooga's stuck in this hip-hop bubble that, or pop music bubble. If you don't hear it on the radio, we don't want to hear it. Well, the good thing about the gay bars here is that they still play dance music. And it's, you know, they, they, they can incorporate uh, pop music from the radio and play the dance music, and they still enjoy it. When we were growing up, the DJs then, they had attitudes. They'll tell you, go fuck yourself. They'll tell you, you know, I'm not playing your song. You're lame. It's a lame song, whatever. You know, and nobody really went and complained. I mean, they'd complain, but then they didn't like, oh, my God, he's got to be fired. I'm never coming back again. I'm, you know, on social media, I'm telling all my friends. Back then, it's like, I just won't come back. They'll tell a few people they don't come back. Now, it's like we have to be... um, we have to pull back. We have to, like, I can't tell somebody, you know, I'm not playing that for you. Because then they run to the manager, they run to the owner. You know, it, it, it happened to me at Regan's place. You know, they, they got mad because they didn't like what I was playing. They didn't, I don't know if they knew that they were in an 80s and 90s club. They didn't like what I was playing. They wanted me to play something, they wanted me to play the wobble. Yeah. And it's 2012, sorry, I can't play it. You know, and then they started, you know, flipping me off and, and making gestures and being loud, extremely loud. And then I, you know, I said, listen, on the mic, I, I put on the screen, I said, you may not like what, if you don't like what I'm hearing, what I'm playing, you don't have to be here. I'm sorry. They go to the front, they immediately complained, and then I got fired. You know, and that's pretty sad that a bar owner or a manager gets threatened by someone making threats to put it on social media. Yeah. So what? There's two sides to every story, right. you know, and that's the problem is that, you know, bar owners and managers, they don't, they don't stick up for their DJs. They immediately say, well, you're, you're replaceable. I'll get somebody that will play what I want. Cheaper, yeah. And not always cheaper is better because, you know, they, 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 they put out a big game. They, they, comp- they say that they've done this, they say they've done that. And then when you go and see their show, then it's like, hmm. Hmm. So what's next? I got some, I got some things I'm working on. Uh, working with uh, Giorgio's menswear. Um, shout out to them. So I've got some other things I, I in my mind I want to do. And I'm um, just looking for the right opportunities to pursue them. Um, Atlanta, what's up? Nashville, what's up? Memphis, what's up? Kentucky, what's up? People ask me, do you travel? I'm like, yeah, you got some gas money? Yeah. And hotel room? I'll be right down there. If I've been actually reaching out to other DJs, you know, just, hey man, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm serious about my work. I'm full time with it. Uh, if you got anything that you can't do, hey, do you, can we do a phone, meet who I am and feel confident enough to refer me? And it's been crickets. I'm not on their level. That's my first thought. But then I've noticed a trend. I'm looking like, wait a minute, is it that or is it, is it, is it or are you intimidated? So you have to look at it from, I'm trying to look at it from a couple of perspectives. So I'm trying to reach out to some coordinators. You know how it is in this industry. A coordinator usually already has their favorite DJ to refer. You know, so how you crack that and get that going. And uh, sometimes when you promote, you do things for free. Sometimes promotion comes with a no check. And you have to be really willing to eat that in addition to being able to create another check long term. So, um, and I've learned to do that. I do like the fact that I can DJ and help somebody else make some money. Something about that just freaking does it for me. I am kid you not, man. I do, I, I, I want to have a bigger, I want to have such a name that when, 
it's, a, it's at an event, people are going to come because they're expecting the excellence and they know it's going to be fun. Well, I mean, I signed with 99 um, as a talent to do um, acting, modeling, and uh, musician. And it, it, I've always wanted to be uh, an actor anyway. And back in 95, I was actually in a B-rated movie called Hollywood the Movie. It, was, it starred um, Morton Downey Jr., um, Phyllis Coates, Imogene Coca, and whatever. It, but I was in that as a drag queen. And, I, you know, it, I got the itch. I mean, it was just a lot of fun. And then I've done commercials, you know, some of the commercials back in the 90s and stuff. And some other different stuff. But then I was like, you know what? I think I want to do this. Because everybody always tells me that I should, I should do, be a comedian or I should act because... You know, I'm, I tend to be too, be a little bit dramatic, but yeah, I mean, I got it, I got it. But um, somebody had talked me into it, and I was like, okay. So I went and did the open call at nine nine, and they signed me on as talent. And I'm still going to DJ. I mean, I just I'm going to uh, I'll probably go to the grave with with my controller, but um, you know, because it's something that I enjoy doing, and it's something that has made me a lot of money and given me a lot of notoriety, and, and it's you know helped me make my name. I'm just trying to get better. Just constantly get better. Um, not actually just reinventing myself, but just trying to, you know, just add to what I've built, add to what I've learned. You know what I mean? Just keep that going like that. Just um, new mixes, new events, stuff like that. You know, nothing. Not too much. Not too little. Just keep on keeping on. If I was not a DJ professionally, I would literally be a custodian. Beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd be a janitor. Lamborghini. Big, Big Trouble and Little Tyler. Yeah. Where the party at, Jack's Edge? Uh, uh, probably here. <laughs> yeah. How old will you be when you DJ your last time? I don't know. I don't know, because I, I mean, I love it. So when I'm not able to live speakers no more, I won't be able to do it. Favorite song? Bump and Grind Remix. Yes, Arco is my favorite artist. Sorry, he's my favorite artist ever, all time. Bump and Grind Remix is the perfect song. The beat, the lyrics, everything. You can play it anywhere, it's the, it's the best. Better than PYT. What song do you use at every event? PYT, Pretty Young Thing, Michael Jackson. My favorite movie, I don't, I don't have one. Uh, Dream Car. I don't have one. Okay. Um, my work band, Chevrolet. Who's your hero in life? R.J. McCowan, Numa Christian Center International, PCCI. But today I'm saying cheese fries. Favorite Spice Girl? Spice Girl's ginger. Is there a second shooter on the grassy hill? I think so. Yeah. Kelly. Kelly. What If I'm gonna do a throwback, it'll be Kid Rock. If it's current, current affairs, probably the weekend. It's gotta be Michael. Where'd you steal your <laughs> Daughtry. <laughs> Anything else? Nah. Questions, comments, cuss words? Fuck.